having us. Thank you. This is great. Now, the thing that stood out to me is you guys have been together for 40 years, and that seems to be really precedented in the industry. But we'd love to just talk about when you guys got together in 1976, were you actually looking for a partner at that time? Were you looking for a relationship? No. That was totally against what her plan was. She had a plan. She plans everything. I have a blueprint. She has a, a map. Blueprint, mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. map of her life mm -hmm. that, that was just, this is going to happen, and then that's going to happen, and then that's going to happen, and then that's going to happen, and the perfect guy's going to come in <clears throat> right about here. And then... Uh, of course. 30, 30 something, 35 mm. maybe, but yeah. I was going to be with a ballet company <clears throat> somewhere, hopefully touring the world. Not exactly what I had in mind, but when love came to town, you don't have much of a say about it. Yeah, how did you know? What did that feel like? A ton of bricks. Mm. I mean, it was a slow, dawning realization that I had fallen for this man. Mm. I mean, look at his eyes. Mm. I, I see it. <laughs> Well, and your life is so beautiful and unique, and you're on the road really 40 years with the kind of life, the travel, everything that your life has been about. What are some of the things that have kept you strong? You know, people ask me, they say, when you go on the road, um, it must be hard leaving home. And I go, I bring home with me. Mm -hmm. Because really, a, a house is a house. Home is, is who you're with in the house. And our children are grown up. We, have, we do miss the grandchildren, you know, of course. We have twin grandsons, uh, Falcon and Riot from Dash and Morgan. And, uh, and we miss our kids, of course, you know. But honestly, when we go on the road, it's, it's really the perfect sort of storm at this point. Because uh, I know that Cheryl loves performing more than anything. She, she was built to be on stage, and she's a great you know, a dancer, and any time she can get in makeup and dance and actually dance and show off what she can do, I'm all for that. It just so happens that this show is perfectly written for that. In fact, I made sure it was. Mm. I kind of nudged it in, making sure that she didn't have one part, but three parts. She plays a rag doll that comes out of a, a box on Only Women Bleed. With and a giant key in my back. And they <laughs> wind her up and she does this great ballet. She plays an insane Day of the Dead nurse. Very dysfunctional. That I used to be the scariest thing on stage until this nurse showed up. And now this nurse is, I'm even afraid to look at her. And she plays Hillary Clinton. Oh, wow. <laughs> because, we, you know, we have a song called Elected that is got to be the finale for the show with, with, with Hillary and Trump on stage and Alice. I mean, it's too good. Which disintegrates into a knockdown drag out between the two candidates. Which may, makes it pretty funny. As, as funny as the election itself. Um, but at the same time, the idea that I can start getting dressed for the show, and then I remember we did this in 1976. This is how we got ready for the Nightmare mm. Show. It was pure showbiz, mm. and both of us knew exactly what we had to do on stage. When we get on stage and we work together, it just, it's great. It's like old times. Oh, I love it. It makes me think immediately. Sorry to jump in. But, you know, the couples that may be listening, you know, their lives may look a little bit different than yours, seeing as how unique and beautiful yours is. But you mentioned really bringing in your two distinct talents. How can you, like, recommend or speak wisdom to couples that have really different talents, but how they can combine them in life so that they really get to live out their passions? You know, for me, I always tell people, you know, especially kids, they go, I don't know what I want to do in my life. I don't know what I want to, you know, point my life towards. And I go, here's the main thing. When you get up in the morning, you should be going to work and you can't wait to get there because you love what you're doing. When you get married, you should marry the girl that you can't live without mm -hmm. and that you can't wait to wake up just so she'll be there with you. That's the same thing. It's, it's connected like that. You know, uh, not everybody is that selective. Some people settle. Uh, I'll settle for this job. And then they hate that job and they hate going to work. And so they don't do well at it. Yeah. They marry this person because they're handsome or cute mm -hmm. and they're this or that. And they realize they wake up in the morning and they don't necessarily want to be with that person all day. Maybe a little while. And I like that person a lot, but they're not in love with that person. They might love them, but not in love with them. And that's the, that's the two things. We have both of that. I, I love doing what I do. You know, I put my career, if I'm going to put it in order of what's important to me, it comes in around fourth or fifth. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Um, but I really do love to do what I do as yeah. Alice Cooper. And I think Cheryl loves dance more than, you know, I mean, that's, that's her life is mm. dance. But it doesn't define me. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, uh, when you talk about identity, God gives us a name. Mm. God gives us our identity. And God is the glue of our relationship. Yeah. When I see couples that talk about a 50-50 relationship, I say, run. Mm. It's a hundred and a hundred yes. and nothing. Yes. If I cannot wake up in the morning and truly think in my mind, how can I make this day better? Mm. I'm certainly not a doormat. However, I'm looking. My job is to make him look good. Mm. And that takes many shapes, many forms. And he makes me know that I'm the jewel in his crown. Mm. And that's the truth. That's, oh. and, and, you know, I tell a lot of guys, I said, you know, it, it, what you do is you get used to your wife and you don't treat her like your girlfriend. I said, what about treating your wife before you got married how you treated her? You date her. You pursue her. Yes. You, I tell people he still pursues me like I'm not already his. And that's mm. important. I mean, romance is important in a marriage. You, you can't just say, well, we're married. Romance is dead. Mm. You know, that's... That's exactly the wrong thing. You know, I learn new things about her every day. Mm -hmm. You know, that I didn't, 40 years I'm going, really? Uh, that's she says, new. You don't like cranberry sauce? <laughs> no, I don't like cranberry. Really? Not today, right? <laughs> you don't like nuts and ice cream? What no. is wrong with you? No. <laughs> I love that. And, well, one thing you mentioned going into the spiritual aspect of your guys' partnership, you know, what does that, what does spiritual partnership really mean to you guys? Well, I mean, we both were both PKs. We're both preachers' kids. Both grew up in you know, the church. Both our fathers married us, mm. each oh, giving I love that. us the vows to say to each other forty years ago. Our dads ago. were in ours as well. That's great. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I I, I, would, I always call myself the prodigal son because I truly was that. I, I grew up in the church. I went about as far away as you could get. Became the poster boy for everything wrong with the generation. Knowing that I had a sense of humor behind it and knowing that the character was definitely a satirical character. Um, and then when I got sober 35 years ago, I came back because I realized that, that was the, that's what I was drinking, trying to fill this hole with alcohol mm -hmm. or whatever I could do, I could fill it with. And it was really my longing to come back to the Lord, you know. And then when I did, I, I felt, well, maybe I can't be Alice Cooper anymore. Mm. You know, I didn't get a book of rules or lists or anything, but I just felt, well, how can I do this? And, you know, and my pastor said, do you think God makes mistakes? And I said, no. And he said, well, look where he put you. Mm. He says, I don't see why you can't be Alice Cooper, but I don't see why it doesn't say anything in here that you can't do that, but your lifestyle is going to be your testimony, you know. And God gave you the talent to do this, mm -hmm. to do what you do. Mm -hmm. I did alter Alice in some ways. Mm -hmm. I made Alice maybe a little more humorous, a little more dangerous in places, but more humorous in other places. But I certainly shaped him into what Alice is now, where it's a family show. Yeah. Well, and how do you think that people can sense that in your relationship? And do you get to then share the faith foundation of your relationship with other couples so that you can counsel them in a way? I think you earn the right to be heard. Mm. It's mm. based on relationships. Mm. Everybody you come, with whom you come in contact is ripe and uh, really desperate for the good news mm. of Christ. And some know it, some don't know it. But I think you earn the right to be heard. And through love, your lifestyle, planting seeds, you earn the right to be able to talk to them. Mm. I, I think it's how you treat people. People notice more than anything else how you treat people. You know, I've always said, I treat the guy that's sweeping the floor the same way as I treat the guitar player. Yeah. They, they all have my respect on every level. I never talk down to anybody, you know, unless it's in a joking way, you know. The band knows that, I, I, I you know, so. And you'll notice that they go, what is it about, mm -hmm. you know, this couple that is so attractive? It's, it's the fact that, well, we do love each other, of course, but there's the light of Christ is mm. hopefully coming from us. I mean, it should be, Yeah. you know, and... Um, 
I have to ask myself sometimes, is there anybody that we know that doesn't know that we're believers? Mm. And if that's the case, why? Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I get inter I do a lot of interviews. I'm very vocal about it. But I always said, I will not bring it up unless they bring it up. Mm -hmm. And if they do, I will absolutely tell. I'm very, very vocal about who I am. Yeah. And yeah, it's turned a lot of people off. It's, you know, it affects your, your status in this world. But at mm -hmm. the same time, it would be worse if they went, oh, you're Christian, that's nice. Mm -hmm. It's, it's much better to be Christian and be dangerous. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, I, always, I always tell people that maybe the most rebellious thing Alice Cooper ever did was become Christian. <laughs> people think, well, you know, the hanging and the guillotine and the chickens and the stain and the blood and everything. I said, that's showbiz. Yeah. I said, what's rebellious? Uh, certainly not tearing up a hotel room. Mm. Anybody can do that. Mm. I said, deciding to follow Christ? Mm. That's rebellious. Because mm. <laughs> who was the most biggest rebel of all time was Jesus Christ. Yeah. He rebelled against the world. He and said, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Mm. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Do you, do you ever notice there are people that you know, couples that you know that you're attracted to? Yeah, absolutely. There's a reason for that. Yep. And you remember, you ever notice there's other couples that you are repelled? Mm-hmm. That's a hard one for yeah. Christians because the ones that you repel by are usually the ones you need to be with. Yes. But the ones that you can't, you go, uh, oh, you know, who's coming over tonight? And you go, oh, great. great. <laughs> and then you'll say, you know who's coming over tonight? And I go, oh, good. Yeah. Yay. Oh, good. Yeah. You know, because there's so, certain people rub you the wrong way or they it's just not something that's easy for you. Yeah. And, and a lot of time Christianity is not easy because you're having to deal with people that you don't necessarily gel with. Mm. And you know there's gonna be that kind of thing going on. Whereas other people you go, oh boy, this is safe. You know, because they're coming over and I, we know them. Yeah. You know. Well, well it's Christians important to live in Camelot. Mm. I mean, they only associate with Christians. I go, look at our camp. Yeah. It kind of feels wide open. Yeah. But, but it's important who you spend time with, <laughs> I'm sure. My manager is a Buddhist Jew. Mm. 47 years he's been my manager. Mm -hmm. And we could not be tighter. Yeah. Great. You know, here I am, you know, a Midwest American Christian, you know, and a Buddhist Jew who have nothing but trust for each other. Mm. You, know. you bring up trust. I wanted to hit on that, so I'm so glad you mentioned that word. Yeah. With your lives having been so full, you know, we say full instead of busy, but really full. You've been all over the world. You've done so many different things. How do you maintain trust in your relationship? Because I think a lot of couples think trust will just be there. So how do you keep that strong? You know, I think it is just there. Mm. I don't even have to think about it. I've never once even thought I wonder what Cheryl's doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure she's the same with me. You know, maybe when we first got married, there was, there, you know, there's that feeling out period of, well, well, you know, rock star, girls everywhere, da, 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 da. I think that, that we got past that pretty early in our, in our life, knowing each other that neither one of us were gonna cheat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew I was never gonna cheat on her. And I, would, I knew her, the quality of Cheryl, that that's just not her. There was never, I don't think I've ever thought about her ever cheating on me. Yeah. You know? So that's, that's maybe something that God put in, into the recipe for our marriage, that I'm going to take alcohol away. I'm going to take uh, this whole trust thing and make that an important thing. And I think God kind of, you know, builds that marriage on those things, mm. you know, because I know people that just nice, nice people that really don't trust each other. Right, right. You Cheryl, know? what would you say? Trust is earned. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, you have to show who you are. There's no second agenda when it comes to me or to him. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, my job is to make him look good. So he knows that. He knows I have his best interest at heart. So where he falls down, I'll stand up. Where I can't, he swoops in. And so it's a great partnership, and it's never 50-50. Mm -hmm. The intent is to be 100 and 100, but sometimes it looks like 90-10, 60-40. It's always shape-shifting, but the intent is to build each other up. Well, you know, when people always say, this is my better half, 
I always go, this is my better 80%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 20%. She's carrying the ball 80% of the time. Mm. You know. Now, that may not be true, but it's, it's, you know. It's what you're intending. It, it's, yeah, that's how I kind of look at it. Yeah. Um, it made me think of when you talked about reasons that things happen, right? And I think a lot of people <clears throat> see events that happen in their life. Sometimes they say, well, that shouldn't have happened, or why did that happen? Or they even say, this is at a higher level of bad. You know what I mean? Like they have different priorities for things that shouldn't have gone a certain way, yeah. right? So I'm just wondering for you guys, can you look back and see that in your time you've been married, there are, were events where you said, why is this happening? Or this event has like, is like critical. And now looking back, you're like that was meant that we learned something about us or something about God in particular. And now you're like actually grateful for it. I'm actually glad that that happened. Well, that's, that certainly speaks to the alcoholism and the drug abuse for me. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was, you know, leader of the pack when it came to the party in LA. It was me and Keith Moon and Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix. And, you know, the party was going on at all times and I didn't realize I was becoming an alcoholic. I honestly didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, I think I'm an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. It was very gradual until I started realizing that the alcohol was medicine and it wasn't alcohol anymore. And we had to live through that. Mm -hmm. We had to, I don't think she ever quit believing in me, but she had to at some point move away and let me get to the bottom of the rung on the ladder and look up and go, help. Mm. And that's when she went, let's go, hospital. And mm. that was the right time, right? And I knew I, had, I needed somebody to do that. Yeah. So her and Shep, my manager both, said, you're going. Mm. And I, I don't think I put up much of a fight. Mm -hmm. I went, oh no, let's, oh, what time are we going? Because I know I, I, I was pretty close. Doctor yeah. was saying, you know, you're getting pretty close to joining your buddies, mm. you know, in the 27 year old club. And I was a little past that, mm. you know, but uh, yeah, that, that was a very tough one. And people even now go, if you could live your life over, would you change that? And I go, no, mm -hmm. because that was a huge hurdle for me. The fact that I don't think there's a picture of me ever before 1983 without a, a beer in my hand. Yeah. Well, and Cheryl, just there's so many women, I'm sure, that listen, and there's been some sort of dynamic with their husbands, some who are listening. How did you maintain your commitment? You know, how did, it, how did you every day just remind yourself of who you were as a wife? I had to move away, as you said. I took our then two-year-old daughter and moved back to Chicago with my family and let God deal with it. I, taking my daughter to church, um, you know, even I fell away for a while. I made a profession of faith when I was 10 years old, fully embracing Christ as my Savior as a child with childlike faith, but not childish. Mm -hmm. And then at 14, I really had that amazing experience of God in my heart, in mm -hmm. my life, complete transformation. And then I came um, into the world of rock and roll, mm -hmm. where it wasn't sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but it was just Sundays tend to evaporate into other days of the week, and church attendance lapsed, and one day became like another. And um, it, it took a while to get back. But in moving away... I went back into the church, and our reconciliation was based on one thing, and only one thing. Not a list of manifestos, not a list of rules, it was this. The counselor said, do you think that you could commit to going to church once a week together? Mm. I was shocked. <laughs> I thought, excuse me, I have a list of things we need to talk uh -huh. about. He said, no, do you think that you can agree to this? He said yes, I said yes, and that was where God really started to work in our lives, being under great gospel teaching, great biblical authority, and just having a heart transplant mm. and a maturity of character. And if I didn't love him enough already, I continued to fall more deeply in love. Any bride that looks at her husband on their wedding day and says, I don't think I'll ever love him any more than I could possibly love him at this moment, is foolish mm -hmm. if it's real love and it's grounded in the love and grace of God. 
you're just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you love each other more as you grow, more as you learn. Absolutely. I love well, that. it was serious for me too to to actually to prove to her. I, and there was no reason she would believe me because I was I had an addictive personality. Everything I did was addictive. Mm -hmm. You know. So if I had a beer, I couldn't have one beer. I had I had one beer that lasted about 15 years. You know. And when it came to drugs, yeah, when I had one hit of this, I went on off of it. You know, I mean, I was just an addictive personality. Um, and so it was very hard for her to believe that I was going to, that personality was going to change. And those things that she saw with me all the time were going to not be there. You know, she says, we're going to go to a Christian counselor, but you set it up. Mm. And, and I went, okay. I took it as, a, you know, the gauntlet was thrown down. I said, if you think that I'm going to lose this battle <laughs> of, you know, I said, I, and then I got addicted to being straight. Mm. I got totally addicted to the sobriety, which I think that was the thing that really worked for me. The addictive personality tur turned on itself, and then I got addicted to being sober. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I would think about was having a drink. Mm -hmm. The doctors even said, your alcoholism is unprecedented. You, you walked out of the hospital and never went to AA and never had a sponsor and never had another drink. And I went, right. Mm. And they said, well, that's impossible. I said, no, it's a miracle. Mm, I said, yes. I'm not a cured alcoholic. I'm a healed alcoholic. That's a big difference. You know, mm. it's, not, it's, it's as if it never happened. Mm. He says he doesn't have a sponsor. He has a savior. I've heard that. That's amazing. I love that. But that's, you know, that's really true. God just took it out of my life. And, I, and they, I, they say, well, well, what was the process? I said, there's no process. Yeah. I walked out of the hospital and... Just believing. You could put a drink in front of me in the most high-pressure situation, and that would never even come into play. I wouldn't even think of it. Yeah. It would be like having a loaded gun there. I'd say, oh, well, put it onto my head. Mm. That's what a drink might as well have poison in it. Yeah. Because I would have, I would have gone, well, what is that? Get that, mm. you know. Well, your story is so unique and dynamic, and I know we have just a couple closing questions. One, just what do you think partnership means to you? That's something that we really intertwine through all of our work is partnership being distinct from just being in a relationship. So what, do you, what does partnership mean to you too? Well, you know, Cheryl had a great, she says, marriage is two dysfunctional people who just refuse to give up on each other. Mm. I love that because it's so true. Imperfect. Name me two no, people are. that are living together, married to each other, that aren't, that are, you know, wacko in this way and wacko in this way. And yet the other person goes, I can live with that. I can live with that. Okay. I can live. I'm not giving up on you. You know, okay. You know, and, and sometimes you don't see your own insanity. <laughs> and... But that's really true. You just never give up on each other, mm. you know. And Cheryl, I heard you say once that never waste a good crisis. Oh, never, <laughs> never. It's a great teaching tool. You know, you go back and revisit it and sometimes think, is this a test? Mm. And if it is, help me pass it because I got nothing here. Mm. And uh, watch, watch him carry you through. When have you ever done anything that where you grew, grew where it wasn't uncomfortable? It's frustrating. It's this. As you see where you want to go and you can't get there and but you keep going until you do get there yeah i you know? love that yeah <clears throat> so just last question for you guys and we really are doing this podcast so that couples can take something away for them to say what can our relationship look like what is our version of being a power couple so for whatever is on your heart what would you really want to give to the listeners and those that would be tuning in well let's understand first and foremost where that power comes from we're not the power couple, but mm -hmm. we rely on a power much greater mm -hmm. than ourselves, our Creator. Yeah, and uh, we are. We that's are. Who we serve. We are not afraid to be led. You know what I mean. You should know that. You too. Mm -hmm. You've both given up careers to do what you do because you were led to do it. You yeah. responded to a calling. Not mm -hmm. comfortable, was it? Nope. I was not. I was on my knees, and I heard the message. Yeah. Like, are but, you sure? I mean, are yeah. you sure? <laughs> See, and then that, that's that's. But look at where you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was the same. You know, that's the same for for all of us. I mean, it's just, don't be afraid to be led, mm -hmm. as long as you're being led by the right. And thing. asking the question, I hear like what I hear in that is like. People think they need to know, figure out the answer. What's the answer? What's the answer? What do I do? But instead asking, what would you have me do? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the takeaway for people. I love yeah. that. It's amazing. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. 
Mm. Well, thank you both so much. I've taken away so much. I know our audience has taken away so much inspiration. Any last words? No, thank you so much for not only having us uh, sit down and talk with you, but to be here at your facility uh, for teens here in Phoenix. Love that you've taken not only what you're both really, your skills and your own purpose, but have molded that into who you are as a couple, and now you just share that legacy with, uh, with the world. You know what it is? It's an outward expression of an inward transformation. Yes. Mm. What she that. said. Yeah, <laughs> ditto. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Thank you. thank you, and happy anniversary. Thank you. The best.